All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's workshop, Ensuring Quality in, uh, in Online Courses. Well, I'm Dan Cabrera, the Multimedia Coordinator and the Online Teaching Coordinator, <laughs> which I split responsibilities with my colleague, Amanda. Amanda, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Amanda Smothers, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator and the Online Teaching Coordinator for now. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> soon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we both have the same wish. All right. All right, so um, uh, now we're here today to discuss online courses and how to ensure that, that your online course really reflects quality or, or a higher standard. So this is an introduction to Quality Matters. It is not Quality Matters. It kind of sort of Quality Matters light. Um, however, I think it'll be very helpful to, to folks who, who teach online and, uh, so that they can look over those components that make up what, what is a quality online course. And what I've done is to provide a breakdown of the important components of quality matters. And I'm going to be providing you a checklist of items that you can give some serious consideration to when you're designing your online courses. So when we're discussing online courses, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask both Dan and um, Brooke, um, who do you think quality matters to? Who, who are the, uh, the stakeholders? Well, and I'm going to ask you to just, you know, in the chat message, well, the chat feature just put down who you think might uh, might uh, quality matter to. I mean, I'm <laughs> all right, students. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brooke. Students, the university as a whole, and my yes, absolutely. Um, I think you identified some key stakeholders. Dan, do you have any other ideas who who might also be uh, stakeholders in in why quality matters for online teaching or teaching period i do i'm trying to enter this um besides typing it in the box and uh, you know i'm on i'm in uh maybe i'm using the wrong browser but for some reason i can't get my chat to work here okay that's fine you can just 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 share oh here we go here we go i'm sorry Oh, <laughs> well, I'm glad you I'm glad you included them. College deans, absolutely. This is super, super important to to, to call all administration, all, all of our of our uh, 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 leaders. Very, very important to. And um, let's see. Th thank you for uh, for sharing that for both Brooke and and uh, and Dan. So students, absolutely, that's what we're all here for, right? When, you know, and, and so we're looking at, at uh, us as teachers, um, everyone actually, and uh, <laughs> faculty and administrators, you know, both, both of our participants have identified chief uh, stakeholders. Um, so they want to know that our courses are really, uh, are really high quality, okay? And it's also important to accrediting bodies. And I think you'll see that most of those answers are what I was pretty much anticipating what they might be. I also added a couple more that we really need to think about because NIU is a state university, and that's our legislators and our taxpayers. They all want to know that our university courses are quality, and, and uh, those include all those online courses. So I think we're correct by saying everyone is important. Everyone is involved. Everyone uh, is, think it is it matters to everyone that we have quality. I would even say that maybe the parents of students coming to the universities, they want to know that their tuition dollars are going toward quality courses. So that's why this topic is really important to all of us. And I'm sure that's why everyone is really interested in learning about uh, more about this today. So uh, we now we know who might be interested in, in, in quality. But why do we want quality online courses? Why does everyone want quality courses? And of course, the first reason has to be to improve student learning and student success. And that also goes hand in hand with improving student retention, which is so important in higher education right now. You know, it's difficult enough to maintain uh, a, a certain level of, of student uh, enrollments. Um, so we want to keep those students who are enrolled uh, at the university and in our courses, and then of course, ultimately staying with their program. So we want quality online courses so that students are going to be here at the end of our uh, of our courses, and we want them to continue with 
whatever program they happen to be, whatever undergraduate program they happen to be, or graduate program. So quality is reflected in a well-designed course. Um, can also prevent cheating. Uh, this is one of those, one of those, uh, I guess, issues that is that exist in face-to-face -face environments as well as online environments. And I think that's uh, something that we definitely have concerns about when we started this online adventure. Okay, we want to also make sure that uh, it promotes interest in the content. So I know that every course that you teach, you have an interest and a passion for. Otherwise, you wouldn't be teaching it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have studied the, the discipline. But uh, that also needs to be translated into an online course. So if you incorporate some of these quality guidelines, I'm, think, uh, I'm thinking that, that it will lead to promoting uh, lifelong learning. Okay. Now, a lot of things are happening online now, and a good quality online experience in school can help foster that sense of uh, a passion for lifelong learning. If, if people have a negative experience, they may say, well, this is just, this isn't worth it. And in fact, may associate online teaching with poor quality teaching. So we wanna make sure that we're, we are doing everything we can to ensure the quality for courses so that students have a positive experience. So when it comes to online courses, how do we define quality? How do we measure quality? And then how do we evaluate quality? I think all of us have some ideas in our heads about what quality uh, what quality course looks like. Now, certain things, maybe even as a student, that we've decided to make the course better for us. If we can remember back to when we were students, what are those things that we found to be more practical, uh, more easy to follow along with? Um, how do we really define it in, real, in a real way uh, and then measure and then evaluate quality? These are all really important questions. So again, those, especially this last one, measuring and evaluating uh, quality, those accrediting bodies want to know how we've gone about doing that. Okay, so no, no afterthought. So that's why it was decided to introduce Quality Matters uh, at NIU, which, and to use it as our standard for how we are defining, measuring, and evaluating quality online courses. So I want you to take a moment to, to read through this. What, what is Quality Matters? Okay, so... Um, First of all, Quality Matters is a nationally recognized set of standards in online course design. It's considered a faculty-centered peer review process because people who are conducting the review process are in fact teachers themselves. They're faculty, they're, they're, they're tenured track, they're tenured faculty um, who actually had lots of experience teaching online. And so it's designed, Quality Matters is, is designed to certify or evaluate the quality of online courses or any online components in your course. And so it's really important that to Quality Matters and to us that we take this approach that is something that comes from the faculty themselves and that uh, any of these evaluating processes are processes that generated or that are or originated from peers. It's also a set of tools and standards for designing and reviewing online courses. So even if you don't uh, have a course to be evaluated and reviewed for quality standards, you can still use this these these guidelines or these tools to start designing your your course okay now to me it takes the form of almost uh, well like a checklist of things that you can accomplish to really ensure that your quality that your courses uh, reflect this quality so quality matters has these four underlying principles uh, they call them and i'm not sure if it's just happen naturally or they're just trying to be clever but they came up with these four c's all right it's really meant to be continuous a uh, continuous process it's a process it's it's something that's cyclic or cyclical so you always want to tap in and improve your courses and make improvements nothing's ever really finished it's not never really perfect it's always in a cycle of a continual uh, or continuous improvement and I think this is something that we do anyway uh, by our very nature. We always want to make sure that the course that we taught this, this semester is better than the one we taught last semester. And the one we will be teaching next time we, we offer the course will be even better. So we always have this process where we're saying, okay, how can I make this more efficient? How can I make this more intuitive for the students? Okay. So once again, it's, it's always a cycle of continuous improvement. It's centered in a couple of different ways. Uh, both in research and in student learning. In fact, all of these standards that we'll, we'll be discussing today are based on scientific studies, investigations. 
So studies that individuals and organizations have done over quite a long period of time. It's not not something that uh, it's just a group of people who get together in a room and then decide, okay, I think this is what we should do. It's really based on research. And, and I could, as I mentioned, it's also on our observation of student learning. So it comes from a perspective of student learning, uh, student learning approach. And I think that this is one of the things that it's really very, very important because it's about improving student learning. All right, the third C is collegial. And that simply defines or is, is reflected in that this process is a faculty driven process. It's a safe process from, from peers uh, that are in the trenches with, with faculty because they are faculty themselves. It's a very supportive environment. And then finally, collaborative. It's meant to be a process between perhaps maybe a course designer and instructional designer and faculty that may have developed the course in the past or faculty that are going to be developing the course. All of these folks become uh, this collaborative team and really defining, measuring, and evaluating what quality is. So I'm gonna take a breath uh, as we absorb all of this. Um, now, there are many things that go into a quality course. And here are just some of them. Uh, there's course design. How is it put together? The delivery, that's actually when the course is being taught. How, uh, that's when the course is unfolding from week to week. How good is the content that you're using? Is the content up to date? I know that I've had the opportunity to work with faculty in which some of the material is a bit dated and I've actually asked about that and they said, well, this this field that doesn't change a, a whole lot. And I said, well, that, that may be true, but I think it's worth investigating whether there's something that you can do to update uh, maybe some aspect of it. The learning management system or the course management system. Of course, here at, at Northern Illinois, it's, it's Blackboard. And I think we signed a contract for however long, maybe five years or so, uh, so that we will be uh, using Blackboard for, for quite a while. The university infrastructure. Oh, thank you, Amanda. It is five years. The university infrastructure. What are all the other things that are going to, that, that are going on besides uh, courses that are being offered? You know, what's the admissions process like? You know, how are student support units? Um, all these things they can affect the quality of a course. And the last two are the faculty ready for this, and are the students ready for this? Faculty readiness, student readiness. We're online teaching. I know that last year when we had to jump into remote teaching uh, because of the the, the you know the, I guess the way COVID has played out um, initially. Uh, if some faculty may not have been as ready as they could have been. Um, certainly some students who were not expecting to be in an online environment were, especially if they had never taken an online course, really were challenged. Uh, everyone is stressed. I know here at, at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, we, we did a lot of workshops for faculty who had not had a lot, great deal of experience with online teaching and what we we've referred to that is remote teaching remote learning um it's not really um didn't really have to do a lot with with preparation because at that point it was just too late for preparation we were we were uh right before i think it was right before the was it, it was in it was in march and so it was getting close to the midpoint of the semester um okay so here's just a list of things that can all influence the quality of an online course. However, when we're talking about uh, what we're talking about with quality matters, it only addresses one of those things, which is course design. However, it turns out course design is extremely important uh, in, in impacting the quality of online courses. And so for the next at least 45 minutes or so, we're going to be talking specifically about course design. And in some cases, we will slip into course delivery a bit, uh, what, I, uh, what I call the actual teaching of the course, because there definitely can be some gray areas for, for what's course design and what's course delivery. Now, we do have workshops that are specific on quality online course delivery. I'll, I'll mention some of them at the end of our, our workshop, give you sort of an idea of what you can use to follow up this particular workshop, today's workshop with. Um, and, you know, we'll start with similar, uh, 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 well, there are uh, webinars taught by uh, in these in these topic areas by my colleagues uh, as well as myself. So if you have any questions on that, uh, what a quality course delivery is, you want to look for those other uh, workshops, those other webinars. 
But of course, um, I and Amanda will be happy to answer them quickly for you if you have something that should come up. And can't wait. So quality matters is not about individual instructors. And I, I think that that initially people are maybe faculty are a little bit uh, off put by this because they think it's 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 measuring them. It's, it's evaluating the quality of their instruction. But it's not. It's not a performance evaluation. It really doesn't measure the individual instructor's ability to teach online. As a matter of fact, when course reviews are done, a course shell is created. And in some ways, you really can't see how the instruction has to be designed into the course. That's just looking at that's just looking at the instructor themselves and not how the course is designed. We're focusing on the design of the course. So so instructors really should not be worried about whether this is an assessment of their ability to teach online. So it's not a performance evaluation in any way. Uh, it's more about quality, course quality. So in many cases, courses are now being designed and developed by perhaps one faculty member, and then they're delivered by another faculty member. So really, it has to be based off of, of the course quality and not about the instructor who's evaluating the course. Another important aspect is that it's not a, a pass or fail test. You know, this course fails or pass. It's simply a diagnostic tool. And so uh, that this, uh, and this is a way for designers and developers to, to be able to look for different instances of quality in an online course. But like we talked about before, it's a continual improving uh, improvement process. So anything in quality course that's being reviewed uh, that may not be to the standards that we're looking for, it's it's just it just means that it hasn't been met yet, and that we're going to be working collaboratively collaboratively to get the course up, up to snuff. Uh, finally, it's not about creating the perfect course. Um, Quality Matters looks for courses that are, well, better than average or what they've determined. The course reviewers have determined to be at about 85%. So it's basically a B plus average for a course. That's what you're working toward. Of course, you can always improve on that and, and get closer to what an A would look like. But it's uh, that's the whole process. So that's the whole rationale behind you know, getting back to the idea about continual improvement. You may end up with a course that, that gets the minimum 85%, but you want to work toward improving it even higher. Um, now, there can never be a perfect course, although I think some of us think that maybe our courses are perfect. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, uh, that's something to be determined. Now, there's always things that can be tweaked and improved upon. Uh, and so again, we're not looking for perfection. We're definitely looking for better than average. So this diagram illustrates the focus on continual improvement and summarizes the quality matter course review. And I'm going to go through it uh, starting at the very top. Let me just see if I've got my little pointer here. Yeah, right here. Uh, let's see. The course. Uh, the course, beginning at the top of the cycle, institutions decide to examine an online or hybrid course as part of a peer review process. And in fact, I, I think Northern uh, uh, will start um, getting that back uh, uh, a regular part of, of, of this, uh, the use of quality matters uh, in the future, uh, sometime in the future, because there, there was a cost involved in having uh, courses reviewed by outside reviewers. However, that doesn't mean that there can't be informal inside reviews, which I have done and, and Amanda has done as well. Now, the institution, uh, when they're ready to submit for a formal review, um, and that's that's because NIU is an uh, institution as an institution is a quality matter subscriber. It may a formal uh, course review in house, both formal quality matters review and a formal in house review process that lead to quality matters recognition. And that's important too. If they, if a course has an online course has quality matters recognition, it's a very high standard, and and that puts that course at a special status. And in fact, anyone who has that recognition should. <laughs> should be really proud about that that's that is a gold star for that for that course for that faculty member who teaches the course uh, but also for the university uh, the institution may also decide to use the rubric informally and that we'll be talking about the rubric and to do reviews using its own process and that's what that i mentioned before this informal process which won't necessarily lead to quality matters recognition but will get it ready for a formal review the second component is the peer course review. Okay. Now, the course is then reviewed by a team of three peer reviewers. This is when we're doing the formal review. And it uses the Quality Matters rubric. 
Uh, now, this rubric is based on national standards of best practice, the, uh, the research literature, and instructional design principles. Peer reviewers must have online teaching experience and complete the peer review training to be eligible to serve on a formal uh, quality matters review. Both Amanda and I have gone through that process. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. The peer review team consists of at least one member from an institution other than the course's a home institution. The team also consists of one member from a discipline that matches that of the course. And this combination of reviewers ensures a, device, uh, a diverse set of perspectives. And so you, if you're teaching a course in public health, like I am, then you want to make sure that, that someone who is on the team has a background in public health. This next aspect is feedback. Okay, so you have the course, you have a course representative, you have the course review, uh, which starts the process and, uh, of reviewing it. And then there is feedback. Now, so this follows the course review. Uh, it's provided to the faculty member or the team that developed the course. And the feedback consists of two components. It's scoring, which indicates which quality matters, uh, which quality matters standards were and were not met by the course. So it makes it easy to say, okay, how do I, how do I have to proceed to as the instructor or as the uh, the course developer? Let's see. Hi, Lynette. Welcome. So what we're talking about here is the quality matters process, review process uh, at this point. Um, fortunately, Lynette, this, this uh, uh, workshop is recorded, so you'll be able to go back and so you won't have to miss anything. All right, so I was, I was mentioning this third aspect of the quality review uh, process, which is feedback. And, and, and the first component is, is a score for each of the quality matter standards. And, and it tells it tells the, the uh, the course representative or the instructor or the fact of the developers of the course what quality matters were met and which were not met and now the feedback also is important because it's a rich set of comments from the reviewers that indicates the strengths of the course areas for improvement and specific recommendations and suggestions for improving the course so it's not just no it didn't meet the it didn't meet the quality matter standards it's what you can do so that it can meet it so upon an initial review, the course may or may not have met quality matters expectations. In either case, quality matters review provides support for course revisions and improvement. If the course did not initially meet quality matters expectation, the team chair, which is the third member of the, of the team, will review the course after the, the faculty members had an opportunity to revise their uh, the, the submitted course. And at that point, it may be, and it could be also the, instru the instructional designer that are working to improve the course. If it meets quality matters expectations, uh, that all courses will work toward and achieve, a, the, that's what the expectation is that all of them will, will achieve the quality expectations. Now this quality matters process is not meant to be a test which in which a course fails or passes. It's the overall goal really is to provide a system for the improvement of quality, of course quality, rather than simply an assignment of a grade or a quality uh, level to the initial course. So it's just sort of an assessment for whether they meet the quality expectations. If they haven't, it's, it just means that they haven't yet. So this is, and that's, if it has met it, then it, then it's qualified, then it is CM qual uh, certified. And, and then, um, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say you're done because you're all, you, as a person who has received quality matter certification, um, simply means that you're continuing the process of making it even better. However, as I said, if after the course review and you receive feedback, you have an opportunity to improve that and then resubmit that. And if it meets the the expectations, then it does get quality matter certified, QM certified. So, uh, so, so and so. You know, that's what we're going to we're looking at a particular course in which this review process takes place. Now, you may be looking also at a mature course. You don't want to have a course that's brand new. You want to have a course that's had a, had uh, an opportunity to have been taught, uh, maybe worked out some of the kinks uh, again that you can use as a process uh, to design your course yourself. So before you even have quality matters, look at it like you want to you want to have a course that you've taught several times. You want to be able to use the checklist, which I will share shortly, uh, to see if you're meeting those standards. But in an official quality matters review,
you're going to be looking for a course that has been taught uh, a number of times, more than once for sure. Probably never a course that's never been taught. And then the course is going to be reviewed using this rubric. And I'll, I'll show you what that rubric looks like very, and very shortly. It's, it's, a, it's a very dense rubric. Um, and we're going to be unpacking it. Um, but the course is going through a review process, again, with course, a course representative or the instructor um, and or the instructional developers and some peer reviewers. So other online teachers that have taken uh, professional development uh, will be course reviewers. So it's people who taught online courses, it's people who've gone through professional development, and who people who, who volunteer to, uh, to, to serve as reviewers for, uh, for, for quality matters. Okay, now they're going to be reviewing the course over a number of weeks. It's not something that's going to be done in, in a few days. It's going to take a little bit of time. So they're going to be giving some feedback to the course representatives, the course developers, um, and if the course meets a ready-met uh, expectation, it's going to go through this sort of quicker arrow uh, right here. Let's see, right here, so that it's um, um, if, if it's met expectations. Now, in some cases, the courses uh, have not met the standards yet, and they're going to get some feedback from the reviewers right here. And there's an opportunity for, as I mentioned earlier, for instructors to improve. Uh, based on that feedback. Um, and then again, there's uh, uh, the expectation that eventually they will meet quality matters uh, standards. And then and there's this loop. It, it continued back up again. Okay, it's a continuous process, always improvements. And so once you've received quality matters certification, you want to continue working toward an even better course. So that's the process, the quality matters review process in, I don't know, a couple of minutes. Um, so quality matters at NIU. Again, there's a lot more to learn about quality matters than what I just shared right here. Uh, certainly there's going to be uh, an opportunity in the next half hour or so where I will talk about those rubric standards, the general quality standards. Uh, I'm going to share a website that has a starter checklist for quality matters design right now. I'm going to put that in the... Uh, in the chat area. Now, I don't mean for you to leave, but I, I want you to have this right here for your reference. Okay. Oops, I think I jumped ahead. Here we go. Um, but what does quality matters mean at NIU? Well, first of all, there is no mandate uh, university-wide to have your courses reviewed for quality. Um, you know, that's, that's something that, and I know that we're all about mandates you know being being uh, determined by certain agencies and all that stuff like this so it, it is something that you're not qual i mean not, that you're not required to do uh, so right now it's more used as a guiding standard for course design uh something that we have on and we've had on the campus for a few years although we have we have held back on having formal reviews for a variety of reasons and we uh, at some point in, in the near future we will have them again some faculty have have used quality matters when when they design their courses. I know that because some of the uh, the uh, instructional designers that we work with have used this uh, as sort of a their template. And today's workshop is here to help you uh, in your course quality design. Not, not necessarily to tell you that you have uh, that you have to have your courses reviewed. So once again, it's it's completely voluntary. It's the minimum a quality standard for the Division of Outreach to promote their courses. Uh, they also have a list of, uh, of courses that have met at least the essential standards at Northern Illinois University. Again, and I'll, I'll explain what essential is. Again, and just uh, if we're going to put it out there and, 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 and promote it, we want to make sure that, uh, that there's this minimum quality standard. And uh, it's also been something that's really a growing community of faculty that are committed to quality online courses, which is a great thing to see. Uh, each time we offer this session, you know, have people come in here uh, and, and, and take the APPQMR, although we haven't done it for, for more than a year, um, it, it's important that, that uh, faculty take this back with them and, and use that to, to enhance their, their course design. So we are growing that community of faculty at NIU who've had the training. Uh, once again, if you, uh, let's see, 
uh, we'll talk about the uh, the all day session app qmr um, in the spring that, that we will be offering okay. so let's talk about the rubric now uh, the rubric has eight general standards, and I want you to look at each one of these components. I'm going to go through each one of these components in some detail. Uh, let's break these down. Um, I think you can agree that as you read through them, uh, that they all pretty much make sense. I, I think maybe there is some apprehension about when you first hear about these standards, that they're going to be rules to follow, and, and then as you read through them, that they really make sense. I, I hear that time and time again from faculty and instructors that I've talked to about quality matters. So the first one is about the design must be clear. Now this is very intuitive for any new instructor, for, for students who are just joining the course, it must be clear what the course is about, how you navigate, is it intuitive in the, in the design? Um, do you have to struggle to figure out how to go from one thing to another? Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, the first thing I look at when I'm looking at somebody's course and I'm helping them with their course, I'm saying, can I figure this out if I were, and now a student, a student new to this course right here, would I be able to just, just from first glance, be able to know how to navigate the course? Now, the second one is going to be about learning objectives. You want to make sure that the learning objectives are clearly stated. And we have, we have course level objectives and we had module level objectives. And the course level objectives are more broad. Uh, still, they need to be measurable. The module level objectives, and these are the ones you, you, that are available for each week you teach the course, they need to be a little bit more specific and, and of course very measurable, but they support ultimately the achieving the course level objectives. Again, for those, uh, uh, those may be different faculty, they might be teaching uh, your students that the assessments are aligned to the learning objectives and explained to the students. So the assessments have to be attached, have to be associated, have to be aligned with the learning objectives. And so if you're saying this, this is what I want my students to be able to do, those assessments should should adequately accurately measure what those objectives are. Um, now we don't get a chance necessarily to have those dialogues with our students, uh, especially if we don't meet with them face to face, like when we're in an online course. So we need to make sure that that's happening in the online course, uh, that they have an understanding that these objectives and these assessments are definitely related to each other. Uh, the instructional materials and resources also must align with the objectives okay so you've got your learning objectives you've got your assessment you've got your instructional materials um, and there is the need to have them align with the uh, with the course level objectives with all of the objectives actually so i mentioned that term alignment you're going to hear this word alignment or align over and over again in the next half hour or so it's one of those uh, uh, foundational uh, caveats of the standards is that all of these components really need to work together they need to they need to support each other um, and that can be a really a great assessment you can have a great assessment you can have really a great instructional material but if it doesn't address the learning objectives those things that you want the students to be able to walk away with uh, doing somehow or some things are missing the point here so you may have great material but if it's not aligned with the objectives or the assessments then it won't work now we want to make sure that <clears throat> that number five here, uh, there's that there's opportunities for meaningful interaction, of course, online uh, of online courses that really are meant to foster interaction between you and the students, and the students with each other, and the students with the content. Uh, now it can really come off as as really passive and isolating uh, if you don't do that. So interaction is super important because if if you students feel isolated if they feel disconnected from what's going on in the course, then they'll, they are likely not to do well in the course, maybe even dropping out of the course or failing the course. We want to also want to make sure that the technology that we use supports learning and doesn't get in the way of learning. And so if you have a really cool technology and you're using it because it's a cool technology, but it's really difficult for students to learn how to use, that would get in the way of learning. And finally, we want to provide support for our students in very real ways. We want to allow them maybe the technology to provide technology support or even support in, in tutoring, like in for writing. Uh, so if you take time to look around, you'll, you'll find that there's a lot of support for online, uh, for all your online uh, students. And in fact, at, at uh, in our department, we provide a template that actually has 
for online teaching for online uh, teaching a a group of links to very important student support services okay let's see let's move on here okay so i did uh, mention uh some <laughs> talk about alignment or aligning things uh, alignment simply is the connection between course components so let's unpack this a little bit more uh, of this diagram from quality matters this is kind of sort of a um, well like kind of a greek parthenon foundational wall and i'm using this to explain to you what quality matters means when we're talking about alignment so at the very bottom let's make sure that i've got my little pointer here the very bottom we have the learning objectives okay now everything is built off of these learning objectives and even though it's a general standard number and even that we even have uh, general standard number two you need to start with good learning objectives they need to be clear they need to be accurate they need to be measurable okay so that's the foundation if you go to the very top that's assessments okay this is the assessment these assessments are going to be the uh, those measurements of how you know the students achieve the learning objectives. So they definitely need to be con uh, connected and work together with the learning objectives. Okay, and so you can see that there are these other components of the course that connect the learning objectives to the assessments. And so there's a couple of other general standards that fit uh, in this alignment theme. There are instructional materials, the course activities, and any of the course tools or technology that you choose. Again, to be a quality course, they all need to be aligned with each other. They all need to support each other. Okay. So you may have great learning objectives, but if the course tools don't match those objectives, don't support those objectives, if you have learning activities that are not really supporting the learning objectives as well, or instructional materials that don't touch on any of the learning objectives or just a few of them, then of course the assessments that you use will will not be uh, will not be accurate. So the website that I mentioned previously has a, a short and modified version of the rubric, um, and that's the that's the link that I shared with you. Okay, that's the rubric that talks uh, about the important components of the of the rubric. So as you can see, it's very detailed. Uh, each of the general standards also contains several of these specific review standards. So this is one. This is one. Let me just see. This is get my pointer again. This is the course overview and introduction. This is general standard one, and it has multiple specific review standards. Uh, because of proprietary uh, proprietary issues, we can't share the the rubric in its entirety. Um, that's something which which you will have. When you take the APPQMR uh, Applied uh, Quality Matters Rubric uh, workshop, uh, hopefully in, in May or in, in the spring semester, I should say. As you can see, it is it's very detailed. Okay, and I mentioned that each of the general standards also contains several of these specific review standards. Uh, I'm using my arrow here to point things out that uh, are important to using the rubric. So we have the specific review standards. Yeah. And then there's a point value to each of these review standards. Uh, you can see that the top two here are very important. They're, they're what I had, had previously mentioned as essential. Okay, so these three points actually indicates uh, this essential standard. And so that the standard are, these are so important that they must be met in order to move forward in the review. If you have something, and if I can just read out this thing right here. So the first one is instructions make clear how to get started and where to find various course components. If that standard is not met and those three points are not are not uh, assessed for a particular course, then you cannot proceed. That's it's sort of like it's not it's not going to be successful. Okay, this is one of those things that has to be definitely met in order to uh, get uh, considered for quality matter certification. So those point values are are very very important. And then annotations. Okay, so another great thing about rubrics is that it does contain these annotations. It's really specific details about what you would look for in a course that would help you to see if the if the course meets a standard. So it's really a really great tool uh, for using. I know that we and and uh, who are uh, who've taken that peer review process really rely on the annotations because it guides us in in assessing whether a course. Uh, for a particular specific review standard has been met or not. Are there any questions so far? Okay, it doesn't seem like that. 
So I talked about the three points. Let me break it down for you in a little bit more detail. There are 23 of those three-point essential standards. There's 12 two-points, which are considered very important, and then seven of them are considered important. So I usually get a bit of a chuckle at this point because there's nothing that's unimportant, and that's really true. But what Quality Matters is looking for, again, is that 85%, the B+, plus, better than average standard. So if at least 85% of these points are met, then the course is considered uh, to have met its standards. So there might be a few of these important or very important standards that you didn't meet, but it's still considered a quality course. And what, what would make you not meet a standard? Well, in some cases, one of the standards, the important standards, is that students have a link to the privacy policy of some sort of technology. Well, if you're not using any of the external technology, you're not going to have a link to a privacy standard. And so it's okay that you haven't earned that point. Each standard is also looked at by reviewers as meeting an 85% standard. So as we go through the standards, I think it will become a little bit more clear, and I'll give you some more examples specific to the standard itself. However, a course under review cannot have any essential standard missing. So let's start up looking at each one of the general standards. Uh, the first one is course overview and introduction. General standard number one has to do with the course overview and the introduction. And that's something that we're all concerned about before the semester begins. We should be asking ourselves, what's going to happen when the students first get into the course? So the first specific review standard is the instructions that make clear how to get started and where to find various course components. So I'd like you guys to share in the text chat area what are some ideas that you have to make, your, to make it clear to your students how to get started. Okay. For instance, uh, you might create a week, a week one folder. Let's see. open up the course. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Course opens to page with instructions, a clear list of instructions. Have a get start. I was about to share that, but thank you, Lynette. Absolutely. A getting started folder. Students will, will look at that and will say, okay, have a, have a week one folder. You know, Brooke, this is a great idea. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to add to that. Maybe you might even have a week zero folder. So when students come and you open up maybe the course a week earlier and, um, and uh, they come in and they actually, uh, get access to the course syllabus a week early. They look at that and they said, okay, this is, this is the textbook I have to buy and this is what I need to do and prepare. Lynette also says to have a start here on the course menu, making it very, very easy. It's very intuitive. It's, it's something that the students, when they see, they'll initially, they'll immediately understand how to proceed. Okay. Now, let's see. in my own courses, I've, I've created a screencast video that walks my students through the online platform. And I show them where to find everything and walk them through the syllabus and the course schedule. I think it's a good idea to give them that. In fact, what I usually do is I'll have a, uh, a, a synchronous session. I usually just have one synchronous session where I'll walk my students through that. And then I'll have that recorded and make that recording available to students. Even if students were there for the session, they can go back and they could refer to it. However, sometimes students are not able to attend that first session. And they, um, uh, they can refer to the recording. And it's sort of a a web tour uh, of the course. Okay, let's see. Lynette says have a start here folder, uh, a start here on the course menu, an introduction course navigation, that's beautiful. Uh, Dan says opening announcement for redundancy. You can't have things done too much as far as I'm concerned. You can have something in the syllabus, but you can also put it in the course itself. Uh, and actually they're, they're mutually supportive of each other, as long as they don't say two different things. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Those are all great ideas. Let's see now. Uh, and now the next one. Uh, students then know how to get started. Uh, this next one suggests that students are introduced to the purpose and the structure of the course. Okay. Uh, so how about the purpose? You want to send out an announcement prior to the first day of class indicating where to find the tabs and the functions. I think we're going to go back to uh, we're going to go back to the structure. I think that's a great idea. Um, it's something I discuss in my screencast with my students or my recording. 
and using a screencast or a recording of what that is is walking people through you know the the course is a great uh, great tool it's a great idea to be able to use it you know kind of it helps us just navigate uh, through the course um, sometimes I mention the purpose in a welcome tab uh, I include that in, in, uh, in my in in my course so that students really know that that this is where they get started. It makes it absolutely clear. And sometimes I'll, I'll send that not just as an announcement, but there's that option that you use when you create an announcement to send it out as an email. And so I, I call it an, a welcome email. So when they, so even before they come into the course, they're welcome to the course. They're given an idea of what they need to do uh, once they get into the course. Uh, I think it's a great way to introduce them, uh, to make that transition from being a complete novice in the course to being someone who's is more knowledgeable and comfortable with using it. So I like the idea about stating what the purpose of the course is. Uh, it might be a purpose where it's sequenced in a program. Maybe it's it's, it's part it, it's part A or it's it's 101 or it's 102, whatever it happens to be, or even li list the skills that that can be expected to be developed in this course. You want to make sure that that it, that it's clear. Uh, you want the students to know what the purpose of the course is. So it puts things in context. All right, this next uh, general standard is learning objectives. So really there are just a couple of standards on getting started, but I think that there are, those are, are the two essential ones that we mentioned, that, you know, uh, the previous general standard. Uh, you wanna make sure that it's something that it's easy for students to not have to search for and, and, and sort of dig up like some sort of a treasure hunt or scavenger hunt makes it really clear as to as to uh, what what they're looking for. Okay. So I'm going to go back and check my online course. I want to make sure that I provided them with, uh, and this is what I do every every semester, even a course that I've taught before. I want to make sure that they do have that getting started component, okay. and it has the purpose of the course. So I know that this particular workshop's gone really fast. And again, and just giving you an introduction, if something kind of jumps out at me, we'll have a, uh, you'll have you know, the rest of the time here to talk about things like individual objectives. So I think I'm going to unpack it a little bit more. Course objectives. I said course objectives are the foundational pieces that everything is really connected to. And in some cases, our course learning objectives have been mandated by our department or even been written down for us. So we don't really have a say in terms of, of what they sound like. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're quite familiar with that. Sometimes the university will, uh, the department will make make these uh, objectives, and hopefully these objectives that are des uh, are described outcomes that are measurable. However, that's not always the case. Uh, if, and if you find that they're not measurable, and that's something that's really important in quality matters, maybe that's a conversation you can have with your department heads uh, or the department head in terms of of, of modifying that. Um, Again, sometimes you don't have the option to rewrite uh, the the course level objectives. However, you may have the option to 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 write the module level objectives. Okay, and this is really important for quality matters because it it um, it says that learning objectives really need to be measurable. But normally, a, a course developer or an online instructor will have the ability to create module level objectives, as I said, which actually really is is very gratifying because that's just something that, that, that will save you. Uh, now those weekly units, those weekly, um, and you break, you, you may break up your, your session by the week, by the module, by the unit, by the section, however you do that. So you can write your module level objectives. You want to make sure that, that they align with those course level objectives. Now, hopefully those course level objectives are measurable. Um, but maybe this is where you can use some, some vocabulary where they're measurable. In some ways, I like to start learning objectives with actionable verbs. If there is a verb in there, you can see that action is taking place in the course. And then you know that you can measure them in some way. For instance, using the word describe instead of using the word understand, because it's really hard to be able to measure if a student's understanding something. So by, by really reviewing your, your, your learning objectives, when you want to make sure that they're measurable to start with by using those action verbs. Assessment and measurement. So the next thing that we're looking for, you're gonna be, are, are 
how are you going to measure these learning objectives? You're going to measure them through assessment. And so Quality Matters is looking for when reviewing an online course, is that assessment you're uh, really measuring the learning objectives? Is it, is it aligned with, is it tied to, does it, is it logical? So if the learning objective, again, is to describe or list something, you need to come up with an assessment that will allow uh, the students to be able to demonstrate those behaviors for you. The next one, uh, this grading grading policy must be clearly stated. You want to make sure that the grading policy is clearly stated. It might be something that you already have in your syllabus, but uh, as Dan showed, it's something that you might want to include in the syllabus, but you also might want to include it in the course itself. Uh, this is particularly important uh, for late work policies, how grades are weighted across your course. You want to add them to the syllabus. And so this is all part of that assessment in a, a procedure. Students are saying, well, I'm being assessed, but how am I being graded as, as what's that connection between the grading and the assessment? I'd also like to recommend that you add them somewhere, as I mentioned before, maybe in the course information area. We all know students will briefly peruse the, the syllabus at the beginning of the course and that's sort of the last time that they open it. Uh, so anytime you can provide a different opportunity for students to see the grading policy, that's really going to help them. It's going to make them again, uh, it's going to make this more of a quality course. Now, you want to be specific and descriptive with your uh, criteria for how you evaluate a student's work. So we're giving a lot of specific descriptive criteria for, and this rubric uh, in the APPQMR rubric for how your online course will be evaluated for quality. Now, what are some ways that you can let your students know how you're going to evaluate the quality of work? Okay, so go ahead. I'm going to share some ideas in the text chat area. So for me, I'll just tell them straight up, you know, I've got, I've got weekly assignments and yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Using a, okay. You, you stole my line, Lynette. Yes. I absolutely have, I actually have a rubric for a weekly assignment, a, a discussion board assignment. It really makes it easier for students to determine what they need to do to be able to have a successful posting in, in discussion boards. Yes. And Dan has the same thing, assignment rubrics. I use uh, rubrics also for the bigger assignments that I have a, individual case study assignment, analysis assignment, and a, a team as assignment as well. Yes, I think, we're, I think we're all using rubrics. Yes, we all, we all you know, uh, have them because I think they're, they're really important. Grading rubric is a great way for the course reviewers to, uh, uh, they can let you, you can provide some specifics and descriptive cri uh, criteria for how you as the instructor are gonna evaluate your student work. And again, in the assessment uh, webinar that we do, uh, I'm gonna get you you get some ideas on 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 grading and feedback with your students in the online course, All right? But let's move on to general standard. Uh, let's see, general standard number four, and that is instructional materials. So the instructional materials could be well textbooks, they could be journal articles, videos, anything that you find that supports what it is you're, you're attempting to teach. Any sort of material that contributes to the achievement of those stated learning objectives, both at the course level and at the module level. Uh, and, and it could be recordings. It could be recordings of lectures that you have, uh, anything that you're providing your students as instructional materials. So again, those materials need to contribute to the objectives. So the reviewers are going uh, going to look back, uh, look for that connection in any way you can make those connections for the reviewers cl uh, clear and for your students will really make it a quality course. So students won't be guessing, you know, you know, is there a connection between the uh, is a, a connection between the objectives and the materials that are being used to achieve those objectives. So, so that, say there's a particular reading that you want your students to, to become familiar with, to review. You want to let them know how that connects to a learning objective or the assessment. And it may be just a simple statement with, read this article, it'll help you answer the discussion board prompt. And it's just creating those connections for your students um, so that they, they realize that the, that the discussion board assignment is not busy work, that it really is meant toward establishing a certain base of, of information, of skills, development of skills. They also understand that it's not, like I say, not busy work that really has a real meeting behind those instructional materials, that they're really tied to that. So as you're doing all of these alignment activities, you may find some gaps or some disconnects as you're reviewing it yourself, even before the course is being taught. So uh, 
what you need to look for in those cases is that is the instruction materials necessary or is what I've been using for a long time it's just what I've been using for a long time and it's time to cycle it up because it no longer supports the the object especially if you revise the objective at some point or no I really think this instructional material is important and maybe we need to uh, to add additional learning objectives because you now realize that oh that learning objective is missing so alignment activities are really important. So Amanda says, I've done both. Uh, the key is aligning the rubric with your assignments and learning objectives. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Brooke says, I'm personally in, in, the, psych, uh, um, in the psych department, so I find the Society for Teaching and Psychology websites very helpful. Okay, so I'm looking at, we're getting close to the time uh, our time right here. I don't think I'll be able to get through all of this material, unfortunately. I go through this right here. Um, let's look at learning objectives. Learning, interaction, and engagement. You want to make sure that any activity that the students do in the course is, again, promoting those learning objectives, and that also supports active learning. Online learning can, can have a bad reputation uh, because it, it feels isolating and passive. So we want to make sure that activities that we design in the course are active learning. And because we're getting into the last few minutes, uh, I'm going to share ideas about learning activities that can support interaction. And discussion boards are really good uh, for, that allow students to interact with each other. Definitely has more kind of action than just reading an article or just watching a lecture, which is more passive. Anytime the students can do something uh, active, it, it's really important. Maybe you're asking them to create videos themselves. Uh, we talk about creating a video, but you could also create a video, uh, uh, or your students could create a video or an infographics, and that's kind of really having them analyze and synthesize work with the content and their uh, and what they're giving you. Okay. Let's see. Instructors plan for course for, uh, for uh, response time and feedback. Providing providing meaningful feedback in a timely fashion has to be clearly stated so students have an expectation. Okay. Then we have course technologies. Yes, I do. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Thank you so much. I'm happy to, to provide that. The, the course technology, the tools and the media supports the course learning objectives. Once again, the course, uh, the course and the media support the student engagement and guide the students to become active learners. Uh, and then I think this may be the last item right here. Oh, actually, it's the second to the last item, which is learner support. The course instruction articulates or links a clear description of the technical support offered and how to access that. You want to make sure that it's clear to the students what they can do, where they can access that, that information. Course instruction articulates a link to the institution's accessibility policies and services, which is also very important because the university is committed to accessibility. Okay. And this last item right here is accessibility and usability. So the course navigation facilitates an ease of use so that students are not struggling to get through to, to be able to, to review that, to, to, to have access to that. Uh, especially if now the university has uh, uh, the Ally uh, tool, which actually provides alternative formats. And then now that we have it available, it should it should make this component a lot easier to get. So the course employs accessible technologies and provides guidance on how to obtain accommodations, which is what that's all about. So these are the eight general standards. Um, you can look at that. Once again, Amanda has has posted the uh, uh, that information there. I mentioned that we will have an APPQMR workshop in the fall. This is an all-day uh, an all-day uh, session in the spring. I'm not sure exactly what month it will be in. Uh, we also provide informal reviews. I've done it for uh, Department of Psychology for faculty members uh, there. There are a number of workshops that I said also support quality online courses, like designing an accessible syllabus, feedback strategies to enhance learning. Strategies for enhancing instructor presence in the online course and integrating technologies to foster inclusive interactions. These are all supportive of a quality online course as well. Now, are there any questions for Amanda or for me?